a huge key in someone's ability to attract money is for them to develop a healthy relationship that includes a comfortable separation from money. Most of us do not need millions of customers to double our income. Most of us would double our best year ever with a couple dozen of our perfect clients. He's a best-selling author, speaker, and co-founder of Brand Builders Group. This viral TED talk with more than 4 million views. It's one of the top 100 leadership speakers in the world by any magazine. Everyone's so consumed with like millions of followers and more people and more reach. When you don't have to chase the quantity of everything, serve the people who are in front of you, double down on that, and at least temporarily procrastinate on purpose everything else. There is some amount of money needed to get debt free, then to have the lifestyle. But after that, you find that that much more money is not really going to satisfy. The truth is, is the new profit. Why is that so important for anybody who's in business? It's super important because Young and profiters, welcome back to the show. And today we are talking brand building, time management, and so much more with one of the world's leading experts on the psychology of influence. Rory Vaden is the best-selling author of Take the Stairs and Procrastinate on Purpose. His insights have been featured on Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, and in the Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. And today he and his wife, AJ, serve as the co-founders of Brand Builders Group, where they teach their clients how to build and monetize their personal brand. Rory, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Yes! I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. I think you're like my newest, coolest friend. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I think the same. I'm really excited for this conversation. Way to bring some great energy to the conversation already. So Rory, you are super well known for actually building brands. But mm -hmm. before you started building other people's brands, you were, of course, building your own brand. And in the past, you said success is never owned, it's rented, and the rent is due every day. So my first question to you is yeah. a softball. Do you still feel like success is never owned? Do you still feel that way today? Like you're renting your success or do you feel like you've owned some of your success? What now? a good question. Also, you guys went into the backlogs. You did. You went, uh, we went to the backlogs. And, like, the, the, back, the back catalog. So that was from Take the Stairs, which has been out over 10 years. Um, so success is never owned. It's rented and the rent is due every day. Um, I do still feel that way. I feel that way. And I feel like the people we work with exhibit that, right? So like, you're still hustling. I'm still hustling. Um, Ed Milet, Lewis Howes, you know, our clients, Amy Porterfield, like these people are still hustling. And, in, in, you know, some people might look at them and go, oh, they're at the top. Like, why are they hustling? But they don't look at it that way. They, 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 they look at, the, you know, Jay Shetty and go, oh, they're, you know, like they're, they're always pursuing somebody or the next level. And th the other thing about that, Hala, is, if you take out that word success and you put in for it, whatever really matters, right? Financial security is never really owned. It's rented and the rent is due every day. Like if you start making stupid financial decisions, you can blow a lot of money quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, being in great physical health, certainly never owned. That's rented and the rent is due every day. Uh, a great marriage or a, a happy relationship, it doesn't matter if you've been married 20 years. If you don't, treat your spouse or significant other in the way that they deserve, like 20 years can disappear in, you know, a one moment or, a, you know, a few minutes of bad, bad decisions. So I, I do agree with that. And I think I look at people like you constantly leveling up. Um, you know, you blew my mind when you came on my podcast and I was just like, gosh, there's such a next level for me in podcasting. And, you know, I got to like, I got to do the work if I want to, if I want the results. So what a great question. And, and yes, I would emphatically say there are some things I've changed my mind on, but that's not one of them. Success yeah. is never owned. It's rented and the rent is due every day. I love that. I resonate with so much of what you're saying and I align with so much of what you're saying. So when you actually wrote those words, like you said, that was decade ago decade now, ago. you were in grad school living in a crappy apartment. Can you tell us about that period of your life and how you ended up starting to speak? Yeah. So, you know, it really started even before that. So I was raised by a single mom and my mom sold um, Mary Kay cosmetics. So my mom had my brother when she was um, 17 years old. 
And then she was divorced from his father a few years later. And then she had me when she was 22. And then she, uh, my, my biological father, they were divorced six months after I was born and I never really saw him again. Mm -hmm. And so she was a single mom and she wasn't, she got into direct sales. And so I learned about direct sales. And then when I was in college, I got involved in a company. I actually went door to door, um, 14 hours a day, six days a week on straight commission, just so I could pay my way through school. Um, and there was a speaker who came and spoke at that company. And I was, I thought, man, that's my dream is mm -hmm. I want to speak. And so, um, I went up to him, his name was Eric Chester. And I said, Eric, one day I'm going to do what you do. But he had mentioned that he had a son in college. And I said, right now I need your son's phone number because I'm going to recruit him to come with me and do this next summer. And, um, and we made like a pact. He said, if you mentor my son uh, in, the, in this like program, then when you graduate, I'll mentor you. And so he did, I did. And his son, Zach, uh, worked with me for two years. We became really good friends. And then when I, when I finished my undergrad and was in graduate school, uh, Eric was the one who, he was a Hall of Fame speaker. And he, he said, I, I, you know, I asked him, I was like, okay, I'm ready. What do I need to go do? And, and I'll never forget, Hall, the very first time we sat down, he said, Rory, the difference between a good speaker and a great speaker is 1,000 speeches. Mm. So the first thing I want you to do is go out and give 1,000 speeches. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I became the youngest person in U.S. history to be inducted myself into the Professional Speaking Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. You know, I've got a viral TED Talk that has like, you know, 5 million views. And I have to tell you, Hala, I'm still excited to go back and see Eric Chester and find out what step two is, um, because <laughs> there's been <laughs> so there's so much so much speaking. Um, so that was that was like how I got my start uh, early on. Amazing! And I learned that you spoke over 300 times for free in your first 18 months. So a lot of people aren't willing to kind of roll up their sleeves, do free work like that. What was the logic? I know you were you were building your reps, but how did you decide? Like, okay, now I'm going to get paid, and I've got enough experience. Uh, so tell us about that. Yeah. So so what actually happened was um, Eric said the fastest way to get stage time is to join a group called Toastmasters. And so it's this worldwide organization. Um, it's been, you know, around for decades. Um, and they had a contest called the World Championship of Public Speaking. And so I thought, gosh, maybe, you know, at the time I was 22 years old. And so I had no credibility. This is long before social media, you know, it was like ever really out. And I thought, maybe if I could win the World Championship of Public Speaking, maybe that would give me the credibility to like launch a speaking career. And so I thought if I just, you know, it was all adults who were in this competition. And I thought if I just got more reps and I practiced harder. And so I did, I went out and I spoke 304 times for free. The first year I made it to, uh, there's 25,000 contestants. I made it to the top 10 in the world and I lost. And then the next year I got more coaching. I spent more time, you know, thousands of hours studying film, made it all the way back to the world championship. And then I, I lost again, actually, but I came in second. So I lost better than the first time. I was the world champion first runner up. And that was just my strategy. That had been my strategy for life, like uh, in school and in, you know, go knocking door to door was like, I'm just going to do a higher quantity than everybody else. And I had this, this belief that if I did more quantity, eventually that would lead to quality. And, um, you know, that's what, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that's what led us to start our first company. That's amazing. And, and what do you feel like speaking did for your personal brand? Young and profiters, I've got a fun fact for you. Did you know that by 2030, over 85% of the jobs that will exist haven't even been invented yet? That's scary. And that's why we need to acquire new skills to stay relevant and adaptable. We've got to embrace lifelong learning so we can future-proof our careers and our businesses.
And that's why you've got to check out Economist Education. Economist Education provides online executive education courses tailor-made for professionals just like us, crafted by The Economist's own editors and special experts. Economist Education courses are designed to sharpen your professional skills in key areas like data storytelling, critical thinking, sustainability, and so much more. I highly recommend checking out The Economist Education course, Business Writing and Storytelling. It's packed with so much valuable practical advice on how to inform and persuade through writing reports, social media, presentations, and beyond. It's like a career blueprint, in my opinion. The best part, these courses are online, flexible, and self-paced, lasting anywhere from two to six weeks. You're guided by an expert tutor. You'll dive into a mix of videos, podcasts, texts, quizzes, and weekly assignments. Plus, you'll get a three-month digital subscription to The Economist to support your learning journey. Economist Education provides access to online forums where you can network with peers from around the globe. In a world where knowledge is power, Economist Education empowers you to lead the way. Economist Education is an incredible way to stay ahead in business. And I've got a special offer to get you started. Get 15% off any course only available by going to my special URL. That's education.economist.com slash profiting and then enter the promo code profiting at registration. This offer ends on March 31st, so don't wait. For 15% off, go to education.economist.com slash profiting and use code profiting at checkout. That's education.economist.com slash profiting. Well, I mean, even to this day, I think speaking is the most powerful way to like, so one of the things that we, we say at Brand Builders Group, we tell our clients, the shortest path between turning someone from a complete stranger into a lifelong fan of yours is a world-class one-hour presentation. Hmm. Like somebody can go from, I've never heard of you. Now they can do that in a book too, but it takes longer. It takes four, it's somewhere like four hours. But if they see you on stage and some, you know, if you've ever seen Ed Milet on stage, right? You could go, I've never heard of this guy. And you walk in, uh, or one of you know another one of my good friends is Jamie Kern Lima. She right now I think is one of the best speakers in the in the world. If you've never heard of Jamie Kern Lima and you step into a room after a one hour experience with her, you it's like you become a lifelong fan. And so that's the power of the spoken word is it is just it is a trust accelerator, and they don't teach it in, you know, they don't really teach it in schools and they don't really teach it in, in business. It's like, if, if you don't study it or get coaching on it, a lot of people think they're good speakers. In reality, they're good talkers. And there's just a, there's just a big, a big difference, but everything, you know, we define personal branding, which is most of what we do now as simply the digitization of your reputation. Mm. And reputation has been around since the dawn of time and the spoken word is like before there before there was going live and before there was webinar and before there was podcast and before there was youtube there was just the spoken word in front of live audiences i think the reason why social media and the reason why youtube and podcasting has is so valuable is because if you have the ability to speak if you have the ability to communicate with authority if you have the ability to make an audience laugh if you have the ability to articulate points eloquently then you can create the same level of trust, except now you can do it at scale. Mm. You can mm -hmm. automate trust at scale when you sort of, I think, combine you know some of my superpowers with some of your superpowers <laughs> and really like you know growing your platform. Yeah, totally. And I, I agree with everything you're saying because I've been doing so much more speaking in the last two to three years. And the types of fans that I get after these types of speaking engagements, like they're waiting in line to talk to me. Yeah. Then they're reaching out to me on DM, on LinkedIn and Instagram. Then they show up to my course and yeah. they say, oh, and then they write me in a review. And it's it's like just a way more passionate type of fan because they feel like they really know you because there's just... Uh, so much transparency and authenticity when it's you in the flesh, just being yourself and being on stage, right? So I totally agree that it like creates super fans. Well, and ironically, I think as AI takes over more and more, I think people are going to gravitate mm. towards that human experience. And I think people are going to gravitate back towards live events because 
you know, it's not that far away. In many ways, it's already here where you can replicate a video of someone, a voice of someone. You can, you know, you can use mid journey and create an entire person that's fake and turn them into an influencer. But what you can't really do is have someone stand on stage in front of a room full of humans and move them emotionally, Mm -hmm. create that human bond. And I think as AI takes over content more and more digitally, I think there's going to be a return of this skill, you you know, coming back for humans. (laughs) Totally. It's like humans are going to be the rare thing (laughs) that everybody wants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's so much to cover. I want to get into all of your personal branding strategies. But first, we thought that it'd be really fun to uncover some of your greatest hits from all the different books that you wrote of, you know, time management, focus, uh, procrastination, and just talking about all these topics that I know my listeners are really curious about. Okay. So uh, the first one, so I'm going to rattle off quotes, and then you can just elaborate. You're going to rattle off have follow my quote? Questions. I'm going to rattle off your quotes. That's so your interesting. Books. You're going to quote me to me. That's, that's, that's kind of awkward, but for me, but I love it. I love it. I did it with James Clear when it was on and it was fun. So uh, we'll do it. We'll see. Okay. Um, Success is not about taking the escalator. It's about taking the stairs. Mm. What did you mean by that? Yeah. So that actually really should be given uh, uh, appropriate like um, citation to Zig Ziglar. Okay, good. (laughs) Zig said that differently. Zig said, there is no escalator to success. You have to take the stairs. And after that, my world championship of public speaking, I was at an event of the National Speakers Association event. And we're sitting in this huge, it's like this huge convention and it's lunch. And I'm sitting in this like cafeteria and I knew nobody, right? I'm this 20 something year old kid and I'm sitting by myself. And this guy walks up to me and he says, hey, you're Rory Vaden, right? And I said, well, yes, sir, I am. Uh, and he said, I, I heard about you. You're the Toastmaster kid, right? Like you made it to the Toastmaster thing. And I said, well, well, yes, sir. I, that, that, that's me. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I don't, have we ever met? And he reaches his hand out and he says, my name is Zig Ziglar. And uh, people today may not even know who Zig is, but Zig was an absolute legend for for decades in this space. And he sat down next to me uh, with his wife, who he used to call the redhead, if you've ever seen any of his old videos. And we became personal friends. He was a personal mentor of mine for several years. I used to travel with him to like these big, huge arenas. Um, you know, he passed away several years ago. But anyways, he was the one that said, there is no escalator or elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. And so even the whole take the stairs concept was a bit of a homage to my mentor, Zig Ziglar. I love that. Um, okay, so next one. A key to self-discipline is, of course, commitment. And you said, the more we have invested in something, the less likely we are to let it fail. What did you mean by that? I want to talk to all of my employers out there. Let's talk about company culture for a second. At Yap Media, we have a really unique company culture, and we're all obsessed with excellence, and we even call ourselves scrappy hustlers. We're all scrappy hustlers at Yap Media, and my team is growing fast. And hiring is a pain in the butt, especially if you're looking for A players that are going to roll up their sleeves. But luckily, when it comes to hiring, I no longer feel overwhelmed by the search for the perfect candidate because I use Indeed, the ultimate hiring platform. Indeed's matching engine always presents me with a pool of high quality candidates that match my job description to a T. If you're tired of drowning in your hiring pool, Indeed is here to rescue you. You can use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging your candidates, making the entire hiring process a breeze. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree that Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. I've hired some of my best employees, Indeed, some of my best scrappy hustlers. With over 140 million qualifications and preferences analyzed every day, Indeed is constantly learning from your hiring preference. So the more you use Indeed, the better it actually gets at finding your perfect match. Join the ranks of more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that have already chosen Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of my show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash profiting. Just go to indeed.com slash profiting right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. 
indeed.com slash profiting. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Yeah, so if if you, anything that matters to you is gonna be hard to let go of. The things that matter to you are the things that you've put the most time and love and energy and money and prayer into, right? So you go, if you lose a loved one, why is it so hard? It's because we've spent so much time together. We have so many shared experiences. That's, you know, we, we have so many interests and stories. Um, and so the irony is that the more we have invested into something, the less likely we are to let it fail. Well, what most people do is they keep their commitments conditionally. They keep their commitments as long as they're convenient to do so. But the moment it becomes inconvenient to keep that commitment, we typically question the commitment or, or we challenge ourselves to go, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe I'm not cut out for this, or maybe it's not worth it. And so they go in search of something easier. And Mm. in reality, they find that there's, there's not anything easier. They keep showing up and the same issues replicate again and again in their life because they struggle with commitment. The, and the real thing to do is when you when you are kind of tested to go, I'm not sure if this is going to work out. I'm not sure if this is the right thing is to increase your commitment. You increase your level of investment, right? If you're struggling on social media and you just go, well, gosh, maybe it's not cut out. You know, I'm not cut out for that. Well, of course, then it's not going to be successful. But the people who are successful at it are the ones that go, no, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to spend more time, more energy. I'm going to hire coaches. I'm going to, I'm going to hire an agency. I'm going to learn, like, I'm going to figure this out. So I think the difference here is going, you don't have a plan B. You, you only have a plan A. Now you have to be flexible to adapt what plan A is, but leaving or quitting or escaping is not one of the options. Mm. And that is one of the secrets of ultra performers, right? They they lock in on a goal and they go, I am going I am going to achieve this. How or when? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm lo- I'm target locked and I'm going to find a way. Mm. Other people go, I'll do it if it's comfortable. I'll do mm. it if it's safe. I'll do it if it's easy. Mm-hmm. But not ultra performers. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, something that Marie Forleo says, everything is figure out of all. So it's like figuring out how, what are are the ways that you're going to figure out how to do whatever goal that you set out. And instead of, you know, contemplating what is the exact right thing I should do, how do I actually do the thing that I want to do? Yeah. And there's always a, there's always a way. So that's another thing is, is that what most people ask when it, when it, when it, uh, when they reach this decisional threshold of deciding, should I continue forward in this commitment or should I not? What most people ask is should, as they say, should I do this? Should I do this, do that? Is it possible? Do I like this? And what the ultra performers do is only one degree different. They don't ask, is this possible? Or should I do this? Or can I pull this off? They simply ask, how is this possible? Mm. How could I make this work? what would it take in order for it to come true? And the moment you ask this question, how, it's like your mind transcends all limitations and you break free of these pre-existing belief barriers and these mental prisons of our own construction of what we think is possible and what isn't. And your creativity engages. And and the human brain, this is where you get into the neuroscience. Well, the neuroscience of this is that the human brain cannot delineate between positive or negative. It simply does whatever you tell it to do. The human brain also cannot delineate between true and false. It simply believes whatever it is told most often. So if you tell yourself this is hard and I don't know if this is right for me, your brain is going to process and find evidence and and documentation and examples for why it's too hard and why it won't work out for you. And it will process until it finds a, a rationalization that is comfortable for you to accept so that you can quit and you can stay safe. But similarly, if you ask the question, how is this possible? your brain will process indefinitely on that. And it will process and process and process until one day you'll wake up, you know, in the middle of the night and boom, the answer comes. And so it's it's not that most people don't have like 
the talent or the skill to succeed. It's that they don't have the the resolve or the commitment. And so they they're not able to see the solutions because their their brain is not actually being programmed to look for solutions. Their brain is being programmed to look for excuses. Mm. That's so powerful. And I think like, you know, all of us have these big dreams, big goals, but a lot of us have a problem with uh, time management, actually focusing on the things we need to focus on, prioritizing. And you actually talk a lot about creative avoidance and procrastination. So my first question to you on that is, why is that so personal to you? Why have you wrote so much about procrastination? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, my first book, Take the Stairs, and and my second book, Procrastinate on Purpose, Five Permissions to Multiply Your Time. Um, So really the way this fits in is I have always been fascinated with success. And um, really, if you look at the arc of my whole career, Hala, I I bucket it with something very simple called the four levels of influence. And so level one is influencing yourself to take action. Mm. You're influencing one person, yourself. And all of my early work is about level one influence, which is basically the enemy of influencing yourself is procrastination. And so we talk about creative avoidance and priority dilution, these, these terms that I invented um, for you know, di- new, different types of procrastination that people aren't aware of. So we can talk about those if you want. But mm-hmm. then level two influence is influencing one other human. And so that is all of my work in sales. And our first company was a sales coaching company uh, that we grew. We started that in 2006. We grew that to like eight figures. We sold it in 2018. We had like 200 people. um, And all we did was sales coaching. That's influencing another person. Also relationships and and one-on-one communication is level two influence. How do I talk and listen and interact with an individual in a way that creates influence, it, it, it moves them to action. Level three influence is influencing a group of people or a team. So this is all the area in the work and the study and the writing we've done on leadership. It's going, how do you act, talk, behave, operate, and create systems in a way that activates a small group of people to take action? So mm-hmm. that's leadership. And then level four influence is really what we're doing now, which is personal branding. And that is inspiring and moving a community of people. It's creating a movement, right? It's it's activating and influencing people who you may never actually meet face to face, but mm. you impact them through your you know, writing, your videos, your podcast, etc. Um, and so that's most of where we spend our world now. But but my early b- books and my early work really stem from learning how to influence myself Mm. and to battle my own beast of overcoming procrastination. And and one of the things I think not enough people understand that you really can't, you can't build a great personal brand until you build strong personal character. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, you need like strong core values that you yourself align to before anybody wants to follow you, because if you're not an impressive person or a well-rounded person with good character, no one's going to want to follow you or be a fan of yours because you're only fans of people that you look up to. Totally. And and um, my pastor said this to me one time. He said, your influence will never grow wider than your character runs deep. Mm. Your influence will never grow wider than your character runs deep. And if it does, that's when the implosions happen, right? That's when the celebrities and stuff, they have these implosions because, you know, they have wide influence in the public, but they have, you know, personal lives that are a mess. And 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 that's what causes implosion. So, you know, you have to build a personal, a strong personal brand on a foundation of strong personal character because the 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 reality today is it takes serious muscle. I mean, you know, you look at the people who are crushing it on YouTube. These are not people just pushing record and throwing it up there. They have mm-hmm. teams of people. They have editors. They're they're thinking of hooks. They they they're they're very intelligent and sophisticated. You look at the people who do marketing and funnels, right? Like to to build an. I, I think a lot of times people go, yeah, just build an online business. Like you know, throw up a website and make millions. It's like no, that's not really how it works. It takes extreme discipline, focus, commitment, you know, intelligence, strategy. And, and that's true about anything. I mean, excellence 
is never an accident. Never, yeah. It, it never is. And so I think we hear a lot more about personal branding these days and we 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 need to hear probably a little bit more about personal character. Yeah. It's such a strong point. And it's such a great tie into everything we're about to talk about. But since I brought it up, uh, what is procrastinating on purpose? Because that feel it feels like you're speaking directly to me because I am this <laughs> type of pr- person where I love to work under pressure because I know I can do things fast, especially if I know what I'm doing. If it's boring, it's more fun for me to procrastinate on purpose. But what did you mean by that? Uh, Give us any sort of guidance you have about time management and procrastination. Totally. Young and profiters, if you're anything like me, you take pride in your own personal space. And that's why I spent a lot of time on my apartment making the, the perfect pink palace for me, all set with the velvet couch, an in home studio, and skyline views of the city. And while I love my apartment, I can get really sick of it. I can get really uninspired. And if you work from home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the good news is, like many of you guys, I'm an entrepreneur, and that means that I can work from anywhere. And so finally, this past holiday break, I decided to pack up my bags and my boyfriend, and we headed to Venice Beach, California. We got a bungalow with a fenced backyard and the change of scenery and the fresh air really inspired some new ideas for my business. And now I'm hitting the ground running in Q1. Airbnb helped me make these California dreams come true. And in fact, Airbnb comes in clutch for me time and time again, whether it's finding the perfect Airbnb home for our annual executive team outing or booking a vacation where my extended family can fit all in one place. Airbnb always makes it a great experience. And you know me, I'm always thinking of my latest business idea. And I found out that a lot of my successful friends and clients host on Airbnb. And I got curious. They told me it's a great additional passive revenue stream. And so I want to follow suit. Me and my boyfriend decided that we're going to spend more time in Miami. And then whenever we're back on the East Coast, we're going to Airbnb our place to make some extra money. So I can't wait for that. And a lot of people don't realize they've got an Airbnb right under their own noses. You can Airbnb your place or a spare room if you're out of town for even just a few days or weeks. You could do what I did and work remotely and then Airbnb your place to fund your trip. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. That's airbnb.com slash host to find out how much your home is worth. Okay, so real quick, there's three types of procrastination. There's classic procrastination, which is consciously delaying what you know you should do, right? I know I should pay my taxes. I know I should work out. I know I should, you know, make this difficult phone call, whatever. But most of us, while, while, while most of us do struggle with classic procrastination, most of us are aware of that. Where we're really losing is to the two types of unconscious procrastination, one of which is creative avoidance. So creative avoidance is a term that that I coined that is unconsciously creating stuff for yourself to do so that you can achieve trivial things which make you feel productive because dopamine is released in your, Mm. you know, that chemical is released from your brain into your body every time you delete an email or you cross something off your to-do list dopamine is released. So it makes you feel good. You feel productive, but really what's happened is you're addicted to accomplishing the trivial. You're addicted to completing the insignificant. That's what creative avoidance is. Then there's priority dilution, which is the chronic overachievers procrastination. They're they're not lazy. They're not apathetic. They're not disengaged. Um, They're not even distracted. What they are is interrupted. So, you know, you're building a team now, you've got dozens of of employees. As you become more influential, more and more people are vying for your attention. You get higher and higher profile clients, higher and higher profile, uh, you know, opportunities. And so everybody is coming at you with their agenda. Uh, You you know, and I I think of an inbox, an email inbox as as a great literal illustration of this, because what is an inbox other than a mechanism for prioritizing uh, other people's requests, right? Like your inbox is none of the things you want to do. It's everything everybody else wants you to do. Mm -hmm. And, And most of us sort even our inbox from what has come in most recent. And we just see what is most recent. Well, often the most recent request is not the most significant request. And so priority dilution is living in a constant state of interruption ending your day with your most significant tasks incomplete, not because you're lazy, 
but because you've allowed yourself to fall victim to whatever is pulling for your, vying for your attention rather than the things that you know you need to do. So um, that was introduced in Take the Stairs. Well, when we studied ultra performers and, and we started to look at how do they get past this, that was when we invented the system of multiplying time. Well, we didn't really invent the system. We just put a vernacular around it, which was what my TED Talk was. So my TED Talk that went viral was called How to Multiply Time. Mm. And all we were doing is, is we were putting sort of like a, a, a vernacular and semantics around the unconscious thought process that the world's ultra performers use when it came to managing their time. And you know, people, of course, say time is the one thing you can never get more of. Well, that's not actually true. It is, it is true inside of one day, right? There's nothing you can do to get more time in a day. We all have 24 hours, which is 1,440 minutes or 86,400 seconds. But that's exactly the problem. Everyone believes they cannot get more time because that's what they've been told most often. So your brain believes it. In reality, you can create more time. You say, how? Simple. And this is the premise of the TED Talk and the whole second book. The way that you multiply time is by spending time on things today that create more time tomorrow. Mm. So there are, while there's nothing you can do today to create more time today, there's all sorts of things you can do today that if you do them today, they will create time and space tomorrow that you would not have otherwise had. We bucket those in something called the focus funnel which again is sort of the flagship framework of the TED Talk in the book. Well, it's eliminate, automate, delegate, concentrate are, are four of the five. The other, the fifth one is procrastinate. And, and what that is, is, is procrastinating on purpose is about procrastinating on purpose with the insignificant tasks, the mm -hmm. trivial tasks. And ultimately, when you become an ultra performer, you ultimately will have to say no to some things. You will ultimately have to ignore some things because there are too many applicants for your time, too many applicants for your podcast, too many emails that you can ever respond to. And so you, you become an ultra performer, not by being a, a master of what you say yes to, but more of being a master of what you say no to. Mm -hmm. and, and if you procrastinate on the trivial things, then that suddenly creates a margin or a pocket of time that you can then reinvest and reallocate into the things that multiply your time, which are things that cr you spend time on today that create more time tomorrow. So that, that's the whole book as fast as I can give it to you. That was so good. <laughs> um, what is the name of the TED Talk? Because I know that went super viral. It's, uh, it's evergreen content. So what is it called so people can check it out? Yeah, so the TED Talk is called How to Multiply Time. And by the way, this is my greatest my most painful, most expensive marketing mistake I've ever made <laughs> is that Why? when Ted asked me for the talk, they, they didn't ask me, what do you want to call your talk? They mm. asked me, what is the talk about? And I said, oh, the talk is about how to multiply time. And so they titled it for me, how to multiply time, and it went viral. Well, when I wrote the book, I had a chance to select the title and I thought procrastinating on purpose was so catchy and unique and clever and people had never heard of it and people have never heard of it and maybe it's intriguing, but the problem is it's confusing and it's not enticing. Nobody wants to procrastinate on purpose, but everyone wants to multiply time. And so this is one of the other really big personal branding lessons that we teach people is that clear is greater than clever. Mm. Clear is greater than clever. So my TED Talk is clearly titled How to Multiply Time. My book, which is on the same topic, is uh, has a crappy title of Procrastinate on Purpose. The subtitle is Five Permissions to Multiply Your Time. It's the same content. The, the TED Talk went viral. That second book doesn't sell that well. And I'm convinced it's because of this, this painful mistake that I made of mistitling the book. Oh, well, hopefully you never make that mistake again. And now we will never make that mistake because we know that clear is better than clever. So that's our first personal branding lesson from you. I'm sure we're going to learn uh, many more. So let's talk about your business brand builders group. What are the types of things that you do for your clients? Hey, young and profiters, let's talk about focus. 
When I started my LinkedIn Secrets Masterclass, I needed focus to create the best course possible. I didn't have time to worry about how to set up my website and collect payments. And that's why I set up my store on Shopify. (laughs) Launching App Academy through Shopify was one of the best decisions I've ever made. We made nearly $500,000 so far. And since I sell a course, that's pretty much pure profit. Are you ready to be young and profiting too? Then launch your business with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, whether you're a side hustler, new entrepreneur, or rocking a multi-million dollar business. And it doesn't matter if you're selling scented soap or a marketing masterclass like me. Shopify helps you sell anything everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. And when it comes to e-commerce, Shopify turns online window shoppers into actual buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. We're talking 36% better on average compared to other platforms with features like abandoned cart campaigns, discount promo codes, and so much more. And fun fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., including huge brands like Thrive Cosmetics and Allbirds. In fact, I interviewed the CEO of Allbirds, Joey Zwillinger, on episode 255, and he told me when it came to their breakout success, it was all about focus. Joey constantly reminded his team that they were a product and marketing company first. Everything needed to come back to making the most comfortable shoe in the world. Allbirds was not an e-commerce business, so they didn't try to be. They leveraged Shopify like me to sell their shoes from day one. And in their very first month, they made over a million dollars in sales through Shopify. And then once they were ready to go into retail, they leveraged Shopify's POS system to scale effortlessly. So take it from me and Joey, no matter your stage, no matter if it's online or in person, Shopify is always the right commerce platform for you. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash profiting, and that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash profiting now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash profiting. Yeah, so we are a personal brand strategy firm, right? So think of if you were building a house, you could go to Home Depot, grab some tools, you know, grab some supplies, you know, roll up on some pile of dirt and start building a house. You probably would do better if you started with an architect Mm -hmm. and you had an architect that understood everything about zoning and permits and everyone about, you know, slope and, and uh, grading and everything about structural engineering and someone who could design something for you uh, that could hold a skyscraper and not just a shack that you kind of threw up. Well, Mm -hmm. That's what we are. We are the architects of, um, you know, we work with several of the biggest personal brands in the world. So, you know, some that I mentioned, Ed Milet, Lewis Howes, um, you know, Amy Porterfield, Tom and Lisa Bilyeu, Eric Thomas, E.T., the hip hop preacher, you know, it goes on and on. Amazing people. So many you've had on your show. Yeah. Uh, so many you, I know that you are friends with. And um, so what do we do for them in a tactical way? We tend to help people get really, really clear on their uniqueness and figuring out what's the thing that only they can do and talk about that nobody else in the world can talk about. So we do a lot around uh, identifying their uniqueness and sort of like their the identity of their brand, not the visual identity, but the actual kind of personification of their message. Um, we do a lot around the art of speaking, the business of speaking, um, live events, monetizing live events, putting online ev- live, live events. Um, we do a lot around book launches. Um, that's one of the things that we probably do as good, if not better than anyone else in the world is, uh, you know, we have helped 29 people become New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or USA Today, mm-hmm. uh, national bestselling authors. And it's not, we don't game the list. We don't let authors buy their own books. We're not tricking the system. We just have r- really you know, proven ways to get real humans to buy books. Um, and, uh, so, so we do that and then monetization strategy, right. Would be, so if, if I had to say, you know, it'd be messaging and positioning, speaking books and then monetization strategy. Um, so, you know, we, we, we get into various components of that, but it's the, the, the single best piece of personal branding advice um, I've ever received. And, and this is not a Rory quote. I, I wish it was. Um, <laughs> but it came from a guy named Larry Wingett. And I heard Larry say this early in my career. He said, the goal 
is to find your uniqueness and exploit it in the service of others. Mm. Find your uniqueness and exploit it in the service of others. And so uh, as soon as the first time I heard Larry say that, I was like, oh, that is it. Like that, that is brilliant. That's exactly what it is. Now, the thing was, he never had a business teaching people or helping people find their uniqueness. So we developed a methodology, a process that we take people through. It's like a, it's a, it's a two day experience. It's this whole set of introspective questions. We could touch on some of them now if you want to help people figure out what is the thing that only you can do. What is your, you know, what is the divine calling on your life? What is your uniqueness? And once we help people find that, that's a huge, huge part of, you know, everything else falling in place. Why is it so important for somebody to focus on one thing, one expertise? Why is that so important? <laughs> yeah, so this is a great question. Um, it's because of a concept that we refer to as Sheehan's Wall. And uh, I named this co concept after a colleague of mine named Peter Sheehan, who showed me a, a model that we have since kind of adapted to personal brands. He, he works more in like the corporate space, but I saw his sort of model. And uh, the, if you th here's how it works. In any industry, in any vertical, in any market, and on any platform, there's two groups of people. There are those who are unknown, right? So they're, they're living in obscurity. They're yet to be discovered uh, or found or popularized. And then there is a group of people who are well-known, right? They don't have obscurity. They have notoriety. They have trust. They, they, they have recognition. They have reputation. Well, in between uh, being unknown and well-known, between obscurity and notoriety is this huge invisible wall that we call Sheehan's Wall. And what most people do who are living in obscurity um, is they look at the people in notoriety, right? Like they, they look at, you know, Tony Robbins or Gary Vaynerchuk or whoever, um, and they look at what they're doing, they, Oprah, uh, The Rock, and they go, I want to do the things that they do. And so, you know, they go, well, well, Tony Robbins has all these different topics, right? Like he talks about money and he talks about health and he, he talks about, you know, unleashing the power with win and date with destiny and relationships and spirituality. And so it's like, well, I have all these topics. So they talk about lots of different topics. And then they're, they're like, oh, I, I've got to be on lots of different platforms, right? Like, you know, the whole thing is you got to be on LinkedIn and you got to be on TikTok and you got to be on Instagram and YouTube and, you know, X, Twitter, whatever. And, and um, so they're on lots of different platforms. And then every time they go on Facebook or something, they see a new ad for a new business model. And it's like, oh, the way to get rich is like doing webinars. No, it's live events. No, you should publish your own book. No, you should become a speaker. No, you should do masterminds. No, you should do retreats. No, you should do one-on-one -on -one coaching, right? And, <laughs> and all these different business models. And so, and, and then they have all these audiences, right? And it's like, well, I'm really passionate about talking to, you know, stay-at-home moms, but I want to help like kids who are like, in, in, you know, in their, their, you know, high school and college age. Um, but I, you know, I kind of live in the corporate world and, but I you know, also am sort of entrepreneurial. And so they have too many audiences, too many messages, too many platforms, too many business models. And what happens is they bounce off the wall. Mm. And the reason that they bounce off the wall is because if you have diluted focus, you get diluted results, period. Yeah. If you have diluted focus, you get diluted results. Um, you know, and so if you look at like Lewis Howes as an example, so he was our very first client. I had met him at our former company. We had been friends. I had sort of like casually helped him with his first book launch. And then when we sold our first company, you know, we, Lewis and I reconnected. He actually called us and said, Hey, you know, I'd love your brain on my business. And, um, he's the whole reason we started brand builders group because we, we weren't planning on doing this. And, you know, we didn't teach Lewis podcast tactics to grow his show. We, we didn't teach him any of that stuff. What happened was we took him through this process and we found that he had 17 revenue streams. And he had always been told by his friends and community, like multiple streams of income. Well, multiple streams of income is crappy advice. It is terrible advice when you're just first starting out. Mm. Nobody who got super rich got super rich from multiple streams of income. 
They got super rich by being amazing at one thing. What you need is not multiple streams of income. You need one freaking amazing stream of income, one brilliant stream of income, one thing that you monetize the crap out of that does really, really well. That's how you break through the wall. Once you're sitting on a pile of money, then you diversify, right? But like Sarah Blakely didn't have multiple streams of income. It's not how she got rich. Like, you know, even Warren Buffett, even though he invests in a lot of things, like investing is the only thing he does. Uh, you, you look at athletes, right? All of these people, they had one stream of income. Well, Lewis had 17, you know, and, and we do this process. One of the exercises we take people through is called the revenue streams assessment. And we just look at which, how long have you been doing them? How, you know, what's the total revenue? How much stress is it causing you? How much no, natural momentum does it have for growth in the future? And it's like, you know, the scoring system. And he had this podcasting thing, which at the time was like a side hustle for him. He was, he was really a course company. Most of his money was selling courses. And, and we said, well, this, this little exercise says that podcasting is the thing that is most taking off with the least amount of energy, uh, causing you the least amount of stress, that is the most fun and has the biggest opportunity for future growth. What would happen if we shut everything else down and just went all in mm -hmm. on this one thing? And so, you know, he's been so generous, like about his praise of us, but really that's pretty much the only thing we ever did. Uh, I mean, he's been through, I think nine of our 14 curriculum. So we have worked a lot with their team, but like the main thing was just going, if you're a small business, I mean, just think about it. If you have, a, if you're a small business and you have limited resources, right? You don't have hundreds of employees. You don't have millions of dollars. If you just have those small, res those few resources spread across 20 things, what's the likelihood that any of them is going to take off versus going, if you take those resources and you put them all in on one thing, it's like the success is inevitable. It doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter what the one thing is. It just matters that there's one thing. And it's, you know, this is where too many people try to make the right decision. And what ultra performers do is they make a decision and then they make it right. Mm -hmm. This is so, so smart. And I feel like it's reminding me a lot about social media strategy too. You don't see somebody blow up on social media where they're blowing up on every channel at once. It's like somebody blows up on LinkedIn or somebody blows up on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. Then they move on to other platforms. So it's like you also have to build leverage on the social platforms as well, not just the revenue stream. So I think going deep and not too wide is the key when you're first starting out. Yeah, you're breaking through the wall. And and, and Gary Vaynerchuk's my favorite example because people, he, everyone says, well, Rory, I think your whole like finding uniqueness is stupid because Gary talks about a million things. You know, yeah, omni-channel, omni-channel. Yeah, omni omni-channel and rap, mu you know, he talks about rap music and sports and web three and social and business and whatever, advertising and, you know, uh, all this stuff. And, and and he tells people, you know, talk about all the things you're passionate about. Um, yeah except that's not how he got there. You can't look at what those people are doing today. Look at how he got there. Gary Vaynerchuk, in the beginning, talked about one thing on one channel. Yep. Wine on YouTube. Yep. So I, I love Gary. I, I, I don't know him personally, but I, I have so much respect for him. I've learned so much, but I go, he did not get there by doing what he's doing now. You can't get to where he is by doing what he's doing now. You have to look at what he did and you break through the wall on that one thing, on one channel, one topic, and just go, what's the likelihood of success? Talking on YouTube and TikTok and podcast and LinkedIn and Instagram about 25 different things or going, I'm going to dominate the topic of wine on YouTube. Obviously. That is such a such a better strategy. And by the way, Gary Vee's, I'm going to meet him for the first time. I think next month Come he's coming on, on the show. So he's I coming can't on the show? Yeah, of course he's coming oh, on the show. So I haven't cool. had him yet, which is crazy. But uh, yeah, he's coming on the show. I'm very excited. Okay, so let's so talk. Cool. Yeah, let's talk about why personal branding is not just for influencers. Why is personal branding something that's important for anybody who's in business? Yeah, well, so let me, let me, I'll start with the common sense <clears throat> and then l let me, uh, uh, let me pull up, I'll pull up some data on this that we can actually look at. Uh, we're big into to data, but so let's start with the common sense part first, right? So if you go, um, 
the, the reason that it applies to everybody is because when people hear the word personal brand or personal branding, they think the wrong things. They think social media. They think it means podcasting or social media or speaking or writing books or creating a course. But that's not how we think of it. That's not how we defined it. To us, personal branding is not a new concept. It's, it's a new expression of an old concept. Personal branding is simply the digitization of reputation. The digitization of reputation, right? Reputation's been around since the dawn of time. What do people know you for? And what do they, who, what do they know about you in real life? And do they trust you? All we're doing with personal branding is digitizing that and automating trust at scale. So I'm not saying those things aren't valuable. They're super valuable, right? They're super mm-hmm. valuable. But like, you know, many of the most influential people you meet and many of the most influential relationships also will come offline, not online, right? Like, um, I mean, even you and I, right? You've got this great following. I've never had a huge, I've never had a huge social media following. Like we've always been like offline, you know, people and we're a coaching company. So even, even the service we provide in the world is very human. It's, it's, it's human, one-on-one human to human kind of thing. Um, but I met you because Julie Solomon introduced you to me. And then I recognized, you know, Jenna and Amy and a lot of our other friends. And it's like, it was your offline reputation that really caught my attention. Um, and then, and then supplemented by your online reputation, which is, you know, clearly super impressive. So, um, I think the reason it matters in business is because, I mean, the reason I know it matters in business is because reputation matters in business today. Reputation is determined at least as much by what your online reputation is as your offline one. And if you don't have one, it's just like going, well, would you want to not have an offline reputation? You, you would never say, yeah, I don't need a, I don't need a reputation. And I don't, I don't need people to say good things about me or to know about me. I, that, that's vain. You would never say that about an offline reputation, but, mm-hmm. but those are the things we sort of errantly say about personal branding online just because it's newer and we don't understand it and because business people don't want to point and dance and do trending songs and spend their whole day trying to deconstruct an algorithm right like that's not how they spend their time but it it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that it's super important and becoming mm-hmm. more and more and more critical so that's the common sense part now if you look at the data okay so if you're going to talk about business people um so we're very, very data driven as a company. You know, part of why we we uh, you do the various things we do is because it's, it's data. And one of the things that we uh, we led a PhD um, a led academic research study weighted to the U.S. Census, a statistically valid, um, and it's a you know it's a national to the U.S. We couldn't we didn't do it for the whole world, but it's, we spent tens of thousands of dollars on this. Um, in fact, if, if you want to go download the study, if you go to, if you go to freebrandstudy.com um, forward slash profiting, you can download a copy of the full study. Um, but one of the things that we found is that 74% of Americans say they are more likely to trust somebody who has an established personal brand. 74%. That's across all ages, uh, income ranges. Like we trust people who have an established personal brand. Um, we know, and when you look at the professions, uh, one of the things that we asked, so one of the questions is, I'm pulling it up here just to make sure I cite it properly. How important is it to you that each of the following people have an established personal brand? And so we asked the general public, uh, which basically like which careers, which professions does it most matter to you that your provider has a personal brand? The, the top ranked spot, 61% of people said they want their doctor to have a personal <laughs> brand. 58% of people said they want their lawyer to have an established personal brand. 55% of people say they want their financial advisor, their banker, their business consultant to have a personal brand. 53% said they want their insurance agent to have a personal brand. 52% said they want their real estate agent to have a personal brand. This goes on and on and on. And, and here's what we found. The higher the requirement for trust, the more the general population cares that you have a personal brand. So the question is, how much does trust matter in your business? If it matters a lot, 
you probably need to take this thing seriously because reputation precedes revenue. Reputation precedes revenue. Uh, so that's why it matters to business people. And some of them have caught on to it, right? Ed Milet, Jamie Kern Lima, um, Elon Musk, like Richard Branson. I mean, these people have caught on to it early and it's made a big impact. Other people have not yet and they're they're falling behind. As you're talking, what I keep hearing is the opportunity for just like people in professions like doctors, lawyers to really step in and and dominate their niche. Like there's really not that many people in those types of professions. And you do see the people that do have a personal brand. Uh, they're traditionally like on billboards or buses. I feel like they probably make way more money than the average person who's not doing those sorts of things. Imagine if they just built their personal brand on social media. Totally. Uh, Because I'm getting more and more like doctors wanting to be on LinkedIn. So I am seeing this as a really big trend. So you brought up trust. Why is trust so important? And what are the tangible ways that people can build trust online? Yeah. So in order to answer that question, you'll see this recurring theme in what we do. To answer the question, how do you best build trust online? We would say, how do you best build trust offline? Mm. Well, if you made a list Okay, so let's first start with the people. If you made a list of the top 10 people you trust in your life, like would trust with your life or with your with your kids, right? Like I've got two toddlers. So like if you go, who, who would you trust? There's a good chance that the people on that list, like you would trust with your banking information or your, you know, like that kind of stuff. There's a good chance you know those people intimately. You know where they eat you know where they live, you know about their families, you know where they went to college, you know where they grew up, you know about their siblings, you know, like, you know, maybe some of their fears, you know, some of their mistakes, like some of where they're, you know, those people intimately. And when I first got on social media, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so stupid. Why is everyone posting pictures of what they ate? And then I realized, oh, because we trust people that we know intimate details about their life. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean you have to post pictures of your kids, right? There's a lot of reasons why not to and a lot of fears why not to. Um, I, AJ and I happen to, to do it a lot. Um, AJ is my wife and she's also uh, my co-founder um, and the CEO of Brand Builders Group, by the way. So she was a, we were business partners in our former company that we sold. And then we started Brand Builders Group, just the two of us. And she's the CEO and I'm the CMO. So, and we're married, right? So we got two kids. So we post, we happen to sh- share those things um, occasionally. So um, we know, we trust people that we know details about their life, right? If I see someone walking down the alley, I've never seen them before. I don't know anything about the person. I don't care what the color of their skin is. If it's, if it's dark and it's an alley and I've never seen the person before, I don't care if it's a man, a woman, or their age. Like, I'm, uh, my spidey senses go up. I'm in an alley with a stranger. And that's how it is, right? Who's going to buy from a stranger? Nobody. So they, there's, they, they got to know something about you. Who else do we trust in real life? Well, we tend to trust people who we learn from. We trust pastors. We trust lawyers. We trust accountants. We trust doctors. We, we trust experts. We trust people. We trust teachers. We trust mentors. We trust counselors. We trust people who teach us things. Um, who else do we trust in real life? We tend to trust people who entertain us, right? They make us laugh. They make us uh, inspired. They, 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 they're musical, right? Like we, they're, or they're entertaining. Like we, we see them on movies. I mean, think about that. We trust movie stars who we've never met, but we see them a lot. Um, who else do we trust in real life? We tend to trust people who encourage us in our darkest moments. The people who were there when you had your heartbreak, when you didn't get into that school or you didn't get that job or the relationship fell apart or, you know, you lost money on that deal. The people who were there to encourage us in that moment, those are the people we trust because it's like we've been through the fire, right? I know you, you got my back. So when you roll that forward to online, we have three, three simple strategies that we, we teach. We call them the three E's for content marketing. First of all, educate, encourage, and entertain. 
educate, encourage, and entertain. And in your, we, we typically say, you know, your feed is, should be more of what you do and it should educate, encourage, or entertain because strangers don't care about your cat. The only people who care about your cat typically are going to be once they, once they're intrigued by you and they want to kind of really vet you out, that's where they go. Who are you really? Right? So, you know, I'm a hardcore Bible thumping Jesus freak. I post Bible verses every day in my stories, right? Because I read the Bible every day. Um, I, I started a whole podcast just looking at the academic and logical scrutiny for the evidence of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and it's called Eternal Life. This was a huge side project. I make no money for it. It's not associated with any churches. There's no sponsors or anything, but it was a huge personal project that I did. I shared all of that in my stories. Occasionally you see it in my feed occasionally you see me talk about my kids in my feed. Most of my feed is education and encouragement because I'm not that entertaining. But if I was, I'd be entertaining on, on, <laughs> that on my feed too. This is such great advice. Um, I align with everything that you say. And I think the biggest takeaway that I had from what you just talked about was the fact that we trust people who know personal details, that we know personal details about. So I get a lot of clients, you know, I do social media for folks. And a lot of people are really like, I don't want to talk about my kids. I don't want to talk about private life. I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to talk about this, that, that. And I'm like, well, we're not going to need to talk about something uh -huh. that, that's personal to you so that people feel connected to you and can relate to you and feel like they, they know you. So I'm, I'm so aligned with everything that you're saying. Um, okay, so one of my last questions for you on personal branding, and we're going to start to close out this interview, is what are the common mistakes that you see people make with their personal brand? Yeah, so, I mean, the number one mistake we already talked about is diluted focus, diluted results. Too many messages, too many audiences, too many platforms, too many monetization streams, just too much stuff. You need to find one thing. I mean, if you think about breaking through the wall, right? It's like, Literally think about trying to knock down a concrete wall. If you took, even if you took a sledgehammer, if you hit all different spots on that wall, you're not doing anything to it. The only way is to hit the same spot over and over and over and over. And eventually it'd be frustrating at first, right? It would feel like nothing's happening, but it would chip a little bit and then it would chip a little more. And you hit it over and over and over. And it's like, this is how it is. You're doing it a consistent, 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 same message, like really, really dominating your, your, your niche. And then eventually you would crack through the wall. And once that first hole opened up, then the whole wall would co collapse. And so the, 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 the mistake is they're doing too many things. They don't have focus. Most personal brands, okay, so we, uh, you know, we have our, our entire methodology, our entire curriculum is actually 14 different two-day experiences. That's like mm. our, our full, like if you did, if you did the full everything we do, 14 different two-day experiences. Well, the very first question in the first experience is a super simple question, which almost nobody can answer. And it is, what problem do you solve in one word. Like, mm. what problem do you solve for the world in one word? And most people cannot answer that question. Like, if you cannot answer that question in one word, there's no way your audience is ever gonna be able to answer that question. So how are they gonna refer you? We mm. buy solutions to problems, right? Like, I get a flat tire, I get, you know, I have a flood in the house and I call a plumber, right? Like, we buy solutions to problems. You have to be able to articulate the problem you solve. If you can't articulate the problem you solve in one word, like, this game's over before you even started, like, sweetheart. So that's the thing is just too much. And, and honestly, that's the only mistake, Hala, that, that really matters. Probably that and consistency, right? Like once you get it, everything else is sort of like, a, you know, a tactic that can be tweaked or figured out or, you know, somebody brilliant like you's got, they got the answer for how to do it. You just got to like find it. Yeah. So- you are like a wealth of information. First of all, I want to invite you to my mastermind to talk about branding. I talk Ooh. a lot about branding, but I feel like you know so much. So I'd love to invite you to my mastermind. And I know that you actually do free coaching calls yeah. at your company. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, totally. So um, we, as, as I mentioned, we're very human experience, right? So we do uh, the first call with everybody for free. Um, if you go to freebrandcall.com forward slash profiting. So freebrandcall.com forward slash profiting. So I, I mentioned freebrandstudy.com forward slash profiting. If you just want to download the study, you can go get, just get the data. But freebrandcall.com slash profiting. 
um, you can fill out a form and we will do the first call for free with everybody. And we just want to hear your story. We want to hear your, we want to hear who you are and what you're about. Um, because I'll, I'll tell you, Hala, if, if there's one shortcut that we've discovered, so we've now, you know, and most of the clients we work with are not the celebrities. Like a lot of my private clients like you are, are people that are pretty well known, but our company, we work with people just starting out to intermediate to like advanced, but uh, you know, all, all the above. But if there's a shortcut to finding your uniqueness, here's the pattern that, that we noticed. And it took us, we didn't know this when we started the company. We figured this out after about like 1500 clients. You are always most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. Mm. You're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. So on our first call, that's what we usually ask about is who are that. you? Who have you been? What challenge have you conquered? What setback have you survived? What obstacle have you overcome? What tragedy have you triumphed over? We want to hear your story. We want to know about you because we know that if we can really understand your story, put a little strategy behind it, then you know we can set you on a path and you know reconnect you with people like Hala that can give you more and more of the tactics and that you're going to blow up but we got to find your uniqueness. We got to know what is the divine design of your life. What is the calling? Why are you here? And for most of us, it's not to be, it, it's at least for our audience of mission-driven messengers, it's not to be famous. It's about service, serving and serving the person that you once were. You're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. Mm. Well, Young and Profiters, I think you should definitely take Rory up on his offer. We're going to stick all those links in the show notes. You should book a free coaching call. Rory, I end my show with two questions that I ask all my guests. The first one is, what is one actionable thing our Young and Profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? Yeah. So other, other than requesting a call with us, which is an actionable <laughs> thing you can do, I would ask you, specifically when it comes to making money, I would say, look at your business and your life and go, where do you have the most natural momentum? Where are you winning the most while trying the least? The more that you can lean into that, the faster you, you, will, make, you will make money. And, and oftentimes it's doing the thing you're already doing, but doing it better and letting go of the other stuff. It's, mm. it's, it's, it often is, serving your current customer in a deeper way. Everyone's so consumed with like millions of followers and more people and more reach. They're overlooking the people that are right in front of them. Most of us do not need millions of customers to, to double our income. Most of us would double our best year ever with a couple dozen of our perfect clients. Mm. And so you don't have to chase the like, quantity of everything. Serve the serve the people who are in front of you. Look at where you have the most natural momentum. Double down on that and say no, at least temporarily, procrastinate on purpose to everything else. So good. Such, such great advice, Rory. Like very impressed with your interview today. My last question for you is what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond business. My secret to just profiting in life? It could be go like, yes. What is your secret to like a profitable life in all aspects of life? Yeah, well, um, it's interesting. So I mentioned my wife, AJ, right? Who's now been my business partner since 2006. Also, um, uh, she took a spiritual uh, assessment, like your spiritual gifts one time. And she found out that her spiritual gift is making money. And I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Like, I want to <laughs> be a kept man, like, um, you know, high role and wifey. So, um but in all all seriousness, I think that a, a, a huge key in someone's ability to attract money is for them to develop a healthy relationship that includes a comfortable separation from money. People who think of money as like a shield or a defense or something that they have to hold tightly onto, 
they are the ones who typically don't have, they never get much more than they have. It's sort of like a closed fist, right? You get to keep what's in your hand, but you're never going to get more than what's in there because nothing can get out, but nothing can get in. Mm. The people who have the most money think of money not as like a shield, but as a tool, uh, a tool to invest and to use and predominantly to give, right? The reason why, you know, like as a Christian, I want to make loads and loads of money. I don't need private jets and, you know, private islands and all that sort of stuff. For me, there is some amount of money, you know, that I needed first to get debt free, then to have the lifestyle that I wanted to have, which mostly included hiring the staff to do all the things that I, that I wanted to do so that I didn't have to do them. But after that, you find that money doesn't really bring you like that much more money is not really going to satisfy you. Um, the truth is, peace is the new profit. Mm, so good. Peace is the new profit. And giving money and using your money to help other people or investing money into, you know, your platform in a way that serves people, that's what's really going to give you peace, not some number in a bank account. Like, it just won't. And I know, I mean, we had four billionaire clients with a B last year. Four bi- Like, we work with a lot of really wealthy people. And I'm telling you, it's it's not the amount of money. Uh, they're all chasing peace. And more money won't give you peace. More fame won't give you peace. Uh, for me, the, the the greatest source of happiness and peace is, is service. Um, you know, and, and uh, f- as a Christian, it's love God and love others. That's the whole message. And it's, it's service. And that's, that's where you'll find peace. And peace is the new prophet. So beautiful. Peace is new profit. I love it. Okay. So where can everybody learn more about you? Um, I know that you've got a podcast. Remind us about the call. Let us know. Yeah. uh, Honestly, if if you're interested in learning about us, I would just say, uh, go to one of the two places I mentioned, freebrandstudy.com forward slash profiting or freebrandcall.com forward slash profiting. Whether you, if you want the study or the call, or, you know, you could do both, but, um, I would just say go there. You can learn all about us. You can learn about our clients. Uh, that'll point you. That'll point you back to me uh, and, and other places. So I would just say you know you know go there, and uh, yeah you know let's 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 be friends. Awesome, Rory. Thank you so much for joining us on Young and Profiting Podcast. Hala, thank you so much for having me. I'm so impressed by you, and uh, and thus very very honored to be to be a part of this. So appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>